Welcome everybody. I'm Chris Harbard. And I'm Mary Sia. And welcome to you from Southwest Wings. Uh, this is the latest and at the moment it's the last in our um, online speaker series. Um, for the moment anyway, we're going to have some uh, more speakers coming up as part of our spring event in the first week of May. So watch out for details of those on our website. But today we're very pleased to have with us Glenn Maynooth. Glenn uh, has been involved with Southwest Wings right from the very start, back in 1991. He's been involved all the way through. And uh, he helps very much with volunteers. He gives talks and he also leads walks as well. So very busy um, helping us is Glenn. Um, he'll be giving us his talk and at the end we're going to ask you to please save your questions and in the um, question and answer box which you'll find as part of your Zoom um, you'll be able to ask any questions you wish and then Glenn will answer them. Mm -hmm. Okay. The uh, talk if you uh, if you miss it or if you have to leave early we are recording it and it will be available online um, and also via our YouTube channel as well, which you can find a link to on the Southwest Wings website. Right. Good. Okay. So, um, if that's all the housekeeping over with, I think we can pass over to Glenn now. We'll say good morning good to morning. Glenn. Yeah. And we'll pass over to Glenn. Howdy, Glenn. Hi, Glenn. Howdy. Good morning. <laughs> uh, thank you for inviting me. I wanted to uh, let you know from the start that since this is a birding conference, I felt really obligated to let you know that there are some avian cloud species. So just a quick look at some of them there too are, are bogus. So the idea is, can you grab out the real ones? Uh, one up here is obviously in the Tucson area or Sonoran Desert area at least. I won't tell you which ones they are. I think they're pretty obvious. Anyway, we'll go to the, the beginning. This slide, uh, I should comment first about the clouds taken from an airliner. They're stratocumulus clouds before I get into my talk. And they're termed cloud streets. And the interesting thing about this is that these streets, some of the cloud streets have the wind blowing uh, either away from you or toward you in that direction. So parallel with these cloud roads. There are other types of clouds that looks similar to this, but the wind would be blowing left to right or right to left. So it's actually perpendicular to the rows. So I wanted you to uh, understand that, not part of the 12 new clouds. At any rate, the presentation today is about the World Meteorological Association or organization's uh, new cloud atlas release. And I wanted you to know that this presentation has been given uh, at a conference we hosted in the American Meteorological Society, all the chapters in Arizona came together and we hosted that at the U of A in 2017. Now that presentation I participated in, but it was started uh, by covering the past in cloud classification. Ron Halling, who's a lightning employee at Vaisala in Tucson, is the president of our Meteorological Association chapter down here in Southeast Arizona. And I back him up uh, and help him out as an officer also. So that was the basis for why I'm interested in clouds, besides teaching it in, in colleges that I've uh, been to. So we're going to look at 12 new clouds, and it's significant that Ron Hawley was the editor in 1978 of the second edition of the Cloud Atlas. So this is the third time it's been published, including 12 new clouds. Let's start the journey. So a little bit about what Ron would have talked about. These aren't his slides. I just adapted them. I have about five slides on the history of cloud classification. So there was an early reference to weather and it's, it's rather crude as I point out here by uh, Theophrastus in 400 BC. He noticed the long thin wispy clouds that he associated with fair weather and, and the winter season not being done yet. But the real basis for cloud classification comes in 1803 out of England by a, a chemist who over there they call uh, pharmacists also by the name chemist. 
And that's what he was, that's what he trained in. And he was a weather observer also. And he wrote his famous essay on the modification of clouds. And essentially it boils down to a classification scheme that we still use today. Now he was friends, he circulated in high places with uh, Goethe and that was uh, a man who uh, had a lot of talent besides uh, poetry, playwright, novelist, statesman, and an amateur artist, scientist, and so forth. And he said, clouds form according to Howard. I thought that was an interesting quote because he's been recognized as the father of uh, meteorology. So in doing so, uh, he looked at the weather of London and recorded it for many, many years. So his writings kind of transformed the science of meteorology into something that had a basis in data. He, his early interest though was in botany and to the point where he wasn't just a plant collector on the side, he actually wrote papers and did a paper on the account of microscopical investigation of several species of pollen and published those transactions uh, or that article in the transaction of the uh, Linnaean Society in 1802. Uh, Goethe further wrote about Luke's passion for meteorology. So people knew him in professional circles and then amongst his friends. So he was in his late 20s when he wrote that essay on the modifications of uh, clouds. And he used a system that was very popular then. If you remember Carl uh, von Linné, uh, Linnaeus, was somebody who uh, came up with a taxonomy or an uh, identification system for naming natural things like plants and, and animals. So Howard named three principal categories of clouds and those still exist today as cumulus, stratus, and cirrus, as well as some intermediate and compound modifications. So he could modify those by combining those three and come up with cirrocumulus cumulus or cirrocumulus stratus. So he was able to come up with a solution to a fairly short-lived phenomena in our natural world, those of clouds, uh, with an elegant solution to the problem of naming something that transforms literally by the second in nature if you watch clouds. His essay includes very detailed drawings that supplement all his written descriptions. And his drawings are his own. He did make some watercolor sketches, but he wasn't a trained artist. So anything that was engraved in the book was done by Thomas Milton. So uh, closing on uh, the importance of his essay, he said that clouds are subject to certain distinct modifications produced by the general causes which affect all the variations of the atmosphere. They are commonly as good visible indicators of the operations of these causes, as is the continence of the state of a person's mind or body. So the key thing here is to realize that when he uses that word modification, it really means classification. Uh, the English language has changed over the years, as you know, and still changes even today. So as I start the process here and, and letting you see or hear about the 12 new clouds, I wanted to use this as the uh, cover slide for that. And it was back in the 19th, middle 60s, that we sent up the first weather satellites. And we really never had a good peak over the ocean. Sure, planes flew over uh, the ocean basins, but from high altitude, meaning out in space, they, the scientists, observers noted this pattern that was very strange out in the uh, oceans. Now this can happen in any ocean, but for right now, we're looking at the Northern Pacific. And so right off the bat, they thought these were contrails or perhaps uh, missile trails or perhaps even some kind of weird cloud trail that's produced. But they pretty quickly figured out, the scientists, meteorologists, that these were proven to be what are called ship tracks and they're long streaky clouds. And they form the same matter as any clouds, any stratus cloud would near the oceans. So the oceans kick up a lot of salt crystals in the surf zone and those are very uh, attracted to water or water droplets are attracted to those salt crystals. So in this case, the ships are putting out of their uh, smokestacks particulates, aerosols, uh, small carbon exhaust products, and it allows for a lot more clouds to form. And how they form, of course, is with condensation around that particle. 
if you do not have dirt in the air, clay particles, uh, soot, whatever it might be, ice particles for snow, you don't get clouds to form uh, in a perfectly pure air. So you need dirty air for clouds to form. In fact, the ships were polluting the air here with you know, millions of nuclei as they transverse the, uh, traverse the oceans. And what happens is you get a lot more condensation occurring, a lot smaller droplets, and the clouds, these tracks are a lot brighter than their surrounding clouds. That's what makes them pretty outstanding. We'll come back to these types of clouds as one of the 12 clouds. Now let's start and, and look at, uh, okay, I'm having trouble advancing, so bear with me as I go back and try to advance some slides here. Well, I'm not having luck doing the things I normally do to uh, keep this from happening. Okay, let's so, okay, try this again here. Okay, I think we're back. And now looking at uh, what went on here to precipitate this. There's 12 new additions to the prestigious International Cloud Atlas. And if you've not heard of the WMO, it's something just like the World Health Organization that uh, Donald Trump got us out of more recently. So this is just a WMO, it's headquarters in Switzerland. It's the, recognized as probably the most authoritative and comprehensive um, source for identifying clouds. And it was, it had not been updated in 30 years. So there's an Englishman by the name of Gavin Pretter Pinney, who's the charter member or founder of the Cloud Appreciation Society. It's an international uh, level organization and that's him by, and you're looking at him sitting on an, a cloud over there on the left. He said, and I'm quoting him, I thought the chances of this becoming official were really minimal. At first, the WMO was saying they had no plans to do a new edition, but over time, I think they began to realize there is an interest among the public in clouds and uh, this need for more authoritative work. So the WMO intends this new edition to increase the public's understanding of how clouds play a critical role in the atmosphere. Now the WMO Secretary General uh, says about clouds, if we want to forecast weather, we have to understand clouds. If we want to model the climate system, we have to understand clouds. And if we want to predict the availability of water resources, we have to understand clouds. So as I alluded to, the Linnaeus system has a binomial uh, feature to it, you know, double naming convention, much like flora and fauna, or that's the basis for the flora and fauna naming convention. So so to it is uh, with the clouds classification system. There happen to be 10 genera, and then they're subdivided into species, and those recognize the, the cloud shape and the structure, unlike the genera, which are defined by their altitude and appearance. And then those species are further divided into varieties, and they happen to describe the arrangement and transparency of different clouds. And then if you pare it down even further, you can subdivide varieties into supplementary features or accessory clouds, and they happen to be clouds that merge with the main cloud body. So in total, you find about 100 combinations of clouds. So these new ones that have been introduced, um, there's one new species, and it happens to be Volutus. And that term you may not have heard before, but you probably know it because if you've seen certain sea cells, I posted a few up there. The first one's a, what's called a volute. The second one is one I know most of you know, and that's the chambered nautilus. That's a cutaway view. That's a volute. Now the next di two diagrams are of a turbo supercharger. And what do you know? It uses a volute too, to ram air into the, uh, the turbine for the supercharger. And then look over to the last columns. One of the three column orders, uh, the Greek column orders is 
Doric, and in that Doric order, you can see a volute there, that scrolled area. So beyond the volutus, there's five new supplementary features. I've listed the names there, and we'll get to those. And notice they're all Latin-based names. But up to this point, they've often been known just by their common names. So now we've given them uh, some scientific type names. And then there's one new accessory cloud called a flumen. There was a special section or a separate section for special clouds that's been removed. And that in the atlas pertained to cloud and the meteor types. Meteors are not meteors in terms of space meteors, but meteors are precipitation meteors, falling types of precipitation. So that section's been taken out and then they've been uh, integrated these special type clouds into a scheme uh, and we'll talk about those clouds a little bit later. For instance, the first one, Cataracta genitus. I won't go through all of them right now. Might suggest that it has to do with a waterfall. We'll find some examples of those down line here. Then there's a species Flaccus that has been formally recognized as being able to occur in association now with stratocumulus clouds. Now, one reason this database of cloud types is expanding is because of the smartphone and its ability to allow photography by most people, as in the layman, to grab pictures on any of these short-lived clouds. And then they send them into the Cloud Appreciation Society. And that society is the one that lobbies the WMO for uh, new cloud changes in the Atlas. So let's go uh, through what some people might think are not clouds. And they've handled these particular phenomena and rather blurred the edge between what is a cloud and what is not a cloud. So rainbows, halos, snow devils, and hailstones, those things fall from the sky or appear in the sky. You don't usually think of those as being clouds, but they're now being included uh, in an area around optics. And I just want to take one example, and that's snow devils, for instance. Uh, one in Colorado on the screen and one in Norway on the screen. Uh, those are things you see in just about any snowstorm that has an appreciable amount of wind. I see them all the time in uh, my ski patrol work up at, for instance, Sunrise. Uh, and I taught my last avalanche class all day. We were getting hit by snow devils. So you have to ask yourself, will you struggle with the inclusion of rainbows, for instance, as, as clouds? Will that bother you? One thing to point out about this Latin an English combination of uh, words is that when we talk about cloud species, that sounds like it's plural, plural, and it could be, or it could be singular. Uh, so the the hint I give you is that there's a mass noun here involved, and so if we talk about a cirrus cloud, it would be a cirrus species as opposed to uh, uh, just being plural, calling it cirrus species. If you get what I mean. So there's no plural, you don't have to take cirrus and Latinize it and say Siri as an example. So here's the volutus. This is the first of the 12 that we're going to talk about. We used to call them roll clouds, and it's the Latin term for the rolling shape. And this is a cloud that is detached from any other cloud. So that's one distinctive way to uh, make uh, distinguishing recognition of it is to note it and see that it's attached to no other cloud. And it has to do with uh, wind speed in one direction between uh, different levels and so-called wind shear. So the cloud, if you see it approach you, would appear to roll around a horizontal axis. And what would come behind it would be a thunderstorm, not attached to that cloud again, but the thunderstorm would be associated with an advancing cold front. So just remember those are detached. Now, what I'm going to do is show you some descriptors like I just covered here and then a picture, and then I will show you several examples so you get the feel for what a roll cloud is. And realize that some of these, where you see radar domes, for instance, up here and down here, those are wide angle lenses. It looks like the roll cloud is bowed and it's they're normally very straight. So it's just being bowed by the wide angle lens. What I don't want you to do is think that a shelf cloud, which looks similar to a roll cloud, is the same thing because a shelf cloud, although similar in appearance, is attached to the thunderstorm cloud. So you can see the very dark areas above all those buildings uh, just to the right of the cross of the X. It's very dark right below the cloud there. 
So let's look at some supplementary features and what those mean now. And they're very distinctive cloud structures that happen to attach to other kinds of uh, clouds. So we'll look at the, the new ones of those. And this is the one that's garnered the most attention. Uh, it's the most popular. People think this is a groovy cloud, in other words. Formerly known as uh, Undulatus asperitus. When uh, you consider the supplemental features, it shows up and almost looking like uh, waves on the surface of the water, but the vantage point you have to uh, interpret from is under the water. So let's say you're under the water here looking up and you're looking at the clouds in the upper right. Doesn't it look like what it would look like if you were looking up at the surface of uh, undulating waves? So un the translation of uh, asperitus is roughness and that's what they look like. So in 2008, these clouds uh, were not widely observed and it wasn't until the WMO was lobbied by the Cloud Appreciation Society. And they did that again by taking a, a series of pictures that were sent into them and said, we need to, WMO, we need to look at this more carefully. And, and they uh, recognized it. So these low level clouds are gonna be caused by weather fronts and they create rolling waves we talked about their resemblance to the underside of a sea. Now, I don't want you also to confuse them uh, with mammatus clouds, and I'm showing you mammatus clouds in the lower right here, but they may have the same or similar mechanism to development. Asperitus, in other words, might form in the same way these do. These happen to form on the underside of an anvil cloud of a thunderstorm from sinking moisture laden air that uh, is very cold and it causes these bizarre shapes. So here's some examples around the world of asparagus. The one in the center is uh, probably the most classic, but all the others count and they look ominous. And that's probably why they're the most popular cloud. Going on to the next one, which is a, now a fluctus cloud. And what you see here is that the old name was Kelvin Helmholtz. Those were two uh, physics scientists. Um, now we've got an official name and their clouds you can see around here. The asparagus, for instance, the previous cloud, you don't see it much around in these areas. I have seen these in the mountains. I've seen these around Sierra Vista. So it's one that you can see pretty rarely, but it, it's distinctive when you see it because they're wave clouds. They're caused by winds above the cloud top blowing faster than the winds on the inside of a cloud top that's uh, beneath it. So that translates to wind shear. That's what we call it, the difference in wind speed, where one cloud is being literally pulled over the top of another. And same thing happens if you think of it on a beach. When surf comes in, the beach uh, is getting uh, making the water shallower and shallower. So the waves run up into the surf zone and keep climbing the surf zone and they finally have to break and crest. They make a, a wave train just like you see there. So let's look at some. They occur, as I said, in mountainous areas. Uh, and you, so you see some mountains on the horizon, but they don't have to. Um, the ski areas, Breckenridge has some examples up there. So I've taken a, a close up in the upper right hand corner of the wave train that's to the main portion of the ski area cloud in the top center. Very distinctive, evenly spaced waves would be a characteristic of those clouds. Now this one is interesting because we used to call them fall streak clouds or whole clouds because they had a hole in them. But now they're recognized as cavum, which is a Latin name for a hollow space or hole. And uh, asperitus, that should sound familiar to you because we just covered that one. And you usually see these uh, when ice crystals are introduced into this thin cloud layer that happens to be comprised of supercooled water droplets. Now, how do they, how do you introduce ice crystals? Well, usually it's when an aircraft passes through the cloud on takeoff or landing, uh, the aircraft uh, disperses and mixes uh, ice crystals. We get the sudden appearance of ice crystals because there's a lot of condensation, uh, condensation nuclei coming out of the exhaust. Remember the particulates for the ship tracks out of the stacks? Well, here the jet exhaust has condensation nuclei. You precipitate at high levels up to freezing level ice crystals. 
that immediately uh, will cause snowflakes to occur and they fall out of the cloud. So you, that leaves a hole. There's some examples of the old fall streak or, or hole clouds. The next are two that are related because they occur together in these supplemental features. One's called murist and one's called cauda. And they're called a wall cloud and tail cloud, respectively. And they're features that are only associated with the cumulonimbus clouds. And if you haven't heard that term before, something means a thunderstorm cloud, a cloud that's producing uh, lightning. And nimbus, nimbo means rain. So these wall clouds are structures in the cloud that lower from the cloud base, and I'll show you those in a moment. And they are also rotating at the cloud base. So the key thing here, and not that we get them around here very often, would be that that would be a probable location where tornadoes can develop. Now the other cloud is called a tail cloud, the old name, now called cauda, a Latin name for a tail. They extend horizontally and they're gonna be going away from the wall cloud, but the air that's in them, that comprises them, the atmospheric particles are actually feeding the storm. So let's look at the wall cloud called the murus. So for a thunderstorm to rotate, it's a special kind of thunderstorm. We don't usually have those here. They can happen in Arizona, the last big outbreak of supercells, and that's what we're talking about here, a supercell cloud has rotation and that occurred in 2017 and did a lot of damage up above the Mogollon Rim up through Flagstaff. But the wall cloud now is recognized down here as this rather ominous looking feature. And what you would see if you looked at this storm as it rotates, you'd see the feed going this way in a helical way. It would just keep rotating. That's a supercell and it's an indication of very strong updrafts. And it's from the bottom of this area down here that you'd expect to see possibly a tornado form. Let's look at some wall clouds. These are all wall clouds. Uh, this diagram is a schematic. So you see the entire cumulonimbus cloud that's so powerful with its convective action that it has an overshooting top. It punches through the top part of our uh, troposphere, the top section of our atmosphere. But at the bottom, that's where this wall cloud occurs and sure enough there's a tornado associated in that diagram. If you look over here very distinctive wall cloud certainly one right in here and I think you can probably pick out the tornado in this the lower center cloud there and one more wall cloud here and a tornado associated one with a rear, rear flanking downdraft out of that cumulon in this cloud. Let's go to the tail cloud, which we now call cauda. It's going to be attached to the, roll, to the wall cloud. And there's, by definition, then typically at the same height. It looks kind of like a dinosaur's tail. And it represents then air flowing into the storm and powering that convective cell that we call a cumulon in this cloud. Sometimes people look at these things these cauda and think that's the tornado. And you can understand why if you look, for instance, at the lower center, that tail cloud is pretty sharp and it looks like just a horizontal tornado. Tornadoes by definition have to touch the ground. So in reality, it really looks more like a funnel cloud. That's a tornado that hasn't touched the ground, so to speak. So this is very interesting and is gonna occur in an area that's uh, right off the wall cloud attached. So I'm, I'm showing you one more uh, example here of, of cauda, so they can be of different densities. Uh, here's one here. Again, in the uh, complex diagram of a cumulonimbus, this thunderstorm cloud, we can reduce it from all its features to what's down here, which is the wall cloud, the wall cloud in, with the blue arrow pointing to it, and then the cauda, the tail cloud, the old tail cloud here with the red arrow pointing to it. That's the features you need to recognize. Now, accessories clouds, that's the next uh, group, that one of the lower uh, levels of the five new clouds. So one that we're gonna start off with is called a flumen, and it's associated with severe convective storms. That means again, thunderstorms, severe convective storms. 
So that prompted uh, the WMO to add two new suffixes, and that would be genitus and mutatus. And we'll talk about what those are uh, in, in later portions. But the mutatus basically means one cloud type forms into another, it morphs. And then the genitus means it formed or grew. It's like something being generated. So let's look at what these are. Here's the flumen. It would look like a low beaver tail. Again, I'm using uh, the idea of a tail, but this is not to be confused with a tail cloud associated with a wall cloud. This flumen occurs in a different place in the thunderstorm. So I'm showing you two diagrams with uh, circles that we don't want to associate with this cloud. That's the wall cloud there, that's the tail cloud. The flumen is somewhere else. So this is the flumen over here. So it's distinguished by its very broad, flat appearance that would be suggestive of a beaver's tail. So these are accessory clouds that have a inflow of air. This band of air goes into this supercell, this rotating cumulonimbus cloud. So flumen means river in Latin. That's why they picked that name. We use it in astronomy. We use it in geology, planetary geology. We talk about flumen features on Saturn's moon Titan, for instance. But here we're applying it to clouds. So flumen, uh, just to show you a few more pictures and make a few more comments, are developing right at the thunderstorm base. That's very humid air by the green arrow of the flumen flowing into this cloud. They're mistaken, again, for tornadoes like the tail clouds are, but they're not. And I'm showing you now one more schematic here, I'm showing you the difference between the wall cloud or, and the tail cloud where the red arrow points, not to be confused with this inflow band that's occurring above, right at the, above the cloud base, above the top of the wall cloud. That's the inflow band or flumen. Those don't happen very often in terms of pictures. I don't have any better pictures to show you than that. And the idea is if you want to see flumen, you're not going to be traveling around here. You're going to have to go to Tornado Alley out in the center of the U.S. the Midwest and, and time your arrival and hope even then that you're able to see a good flumen example. Now we go to what were called anthropogenic clouds. You can get it probably from the Latin there that those are man-caused clouds. The new name assigned would be Homo genitus. And they can happen as cirrus varieties or cumulus varieties. So they're artificial clouds. And the uh, for prime three examples would be clouds above power plant cooling towers or industrial smokestacks that are off gassing, for instance, steam, or aircraft contrails are by far the most common. So we see these clouds beginning at the time of the Industrial Revolution, the introduction of fossil fuels, a byproduct of the exhaust of fossil fuels, among other gases, would be water vapor. And water vapor is what condenses, of course, in the clouds. And you'd see these emitted by nuclear thermal uh, power plants, the cooling towers, or the geothermal power plants. I'll show you some pictures of those. So these new, rather new atmospheric conditions, and I say new because it's since the Industrial Revolution or in history, enhance cloud formation uh, because they're adding uh, moisture, they're adding the convection, the warm, moist air being powered up through a cooling tower, for instance. Uh, some people have uh, researched ways to use the products of these, but uh, nothing's been marketed yet, of course. And I'm just wanting you to know that the, the, the greatest number of these anthropogenic clouds are airplane contrails, which are not what you're looking at on the screen. We're back to shift tracks, which would be another type of anthropogenic or homogenitous cloud. So these are the th ones we looked at on my cover slide. Uh, just to give you some sense of scale, the right lower corner picture is of the California coast. Off the coast, you see a lot of ship trails as you go up the coast. In the center of that picture is Oregon and the Washington coast. And then, then finally, uh, up in this area is Vancouver Island, that exposed landmass there. So homogenitus clouds, the ones across the top that I'm going to cover first are just examples of aircraft contrails. However, this one, look at the contrails coming off the props of the C-130 Hercules. Traditionally, we see this 
typically coming out of jets or this, this look down here, the exhaust particles causing condensation. But you'll see them on the front edge of wings, like on this F-15 fighter, and also off the uh, vortex shedding that goes on off the wing tips. So this representation is, again, of a lot of contrails. It just happens to be that it's dark down where the person stood that took the picture. And it's still light up in the clouds, but still at sunset. So you're getting this brilliant red. And then over on the right, I'm letting you know that you even get homogeneous clouds off race cars, uh, particularly off their, uh, their surfaces that are used for uh, pressing them to the ground, like these wings here. You see the two fumes or vapor trails coming off. And then this hard top racer down here, the same thing going on. Some examples around here, these four shots that I'm circulating now through, show thermal power plants left and right here and the clouds coming up from them. So those are cumulus type development clouds as opposed to stratus clouds. And then more cumulus clouds here coming off this uh, smokestack emission. This is a dairy plant factory over in Spain that has caused this layer of clouds just by the products that they put out. So these are man-made clouds. And the last section is under this red division line. And you can see these from uh, our houses, or our, our valley here, the San Pedro Valley, Sierra Vista area. I've seen them both to the west and to the east. So to the west, we have Vandenberg Air Force Base where missile launches are conducted down the Pacific test range towards Kwajalein. And when these occur, they are occurring in the upper atmosphere. Of course, they're occurring at dark. That's when we would see them. But in the upper atmosphere, beyond the troposphere that we live in, our weather zone, there's the the next zone called the stratosphere and into the mesospheres where these clouds can occur. These are missile trails. And you say, well, the missile is flying very jaggedly. Well, it really isn't. The missile is flying straight in these very high atmos atmospheric levels and there's wind shear all around. But they're, they're very bright. These clouds, you see them at night, it would be dark down at the surface here. The other place to see these, if you're not looking west, would be to the east. In New Mexico, there's the White Sands Missile Range run by the Army. They launch missiles, and I've seen these tracks infrequently. I mean, it's, it's rarely, but if you know the missile time, the launch, if you can track those, and you can do it through Vandenberg, the Air Force Pacific Range, or the Army, you can often see these if they're shot way up high into the atmosphere. So let's look at the next group, um, Homo mutatus. Now, Homo, again, referring to man, so you're talking about a man-made cloud, but mutatus, as the Latin suggests, is a mutation. So we're talking about clouds formed by human, but they underwent some type of cloud change, and they even form a more natural appearance. So these are going to be found in cirrus clouds, cirrocumulus, and cirrostratus clouds. The best examples, again, falling back on aircraft contrails, would be if the atmosphere is set up so there's enough humidity to allow these uh, features, these contrails, to persist for many hours. And they'll grow and they'll spread out in the cirrostratus or cirrocumulus clouds. So what you're seeing up here on this lower slide is a contrail. Uh, you see them every day, I'm sure, on clear days. But what you might not realize is this area right over here was a sharp contrail like the one I just showed you, but now it is glaciating. It is dropping ice crystals into the wind. The wind is blowing toward the left of the screen. So this is a decaying contrail, but it's glaciating. Here's a better example up here, now that you know what to look for, an old contrail that's now mutated. Let's take a look at some examples of these. And most of them, if not all of them, are contrail based. Um, here and you can just see how, for instance, in the lower right, there's a lot of contrails there. Some are more recent, but if you look closely, some are uh, staying around for hours and those are the ones that are continuing to glaciate and they're putting out these cirrus streaks of ice crystals. It's like snow up there, uh, like a snow shower up there. That's what you're seeing. We travel next to a descriptor, a new descriptor called cataract uh, genitus. So we're saying water falls generate clouds in Latin, essentially. So they're generated by the spray from large waterfalls, large being the key. So if you go up Ramsey Canyon and look at the waterfall 
I'm not talking about clouds forming there because that, that waterfall or up uh, a hike up uh, Car Canyon and, and into the box, up Brown Canyon box. That waterfall is not big enough. These have to be sizable waterfalls and we'll see these examples. So the waterfalls that are sizable causes massive downdraft of falling water. Just by friction, the water gets the air moving. And if you move a lot of air down, by definition, you have to move it up also. So when you move the air up, that's what's forming the cloud is that water droplets that are being lofted up. And why do I say you need both up and down movement? Well, water all obviously falls in the river off the fall and it falls by gravity, but we can't keep piling up the air, the cold air that comes with it down there. So it has to be offset by air that's rising. So that's where these clouds come from. Cataract genitus. They're mainly going to form uh, from uh, stratus clouds or what are called broken stratus, stratus fractus. So you'll need more than a trickle to see this cloud. So uh, this is the Niagara Falls, the Maid of the Mist approaching. And there's another example of Niagara Falls. But let's look at some different falls. To the left of the red line, that borderline would be on the Zambezi River and what is called Zimbabwe. We used to call that Rhodesia. And this is Victoria Falls. It's known as a large waterfall in the world. And you can see all, and it's a wide waterfall across. And you can see that it produces cataracta genitus clouds. All the other clouds uh, to the right of the red line are Niagara Falls, throwing up different examples of uh, cataracta genitus. This is one I'll spend a few moments on because they're very interesting and you can see them around here. Why? Because we have forest fires around here. So the new name is flamogenitus. And that means a, a cloud that's forming from flames or from forest fires. Now it doesn't have to be exclusively forest fires. It could actually be volcanoes, uh, any hot source, very hot source of a uh, eruption or of rising air. So convection is the key here. Introducing heat, heat rises, that's called convection. So phenomena can be associated with forest fires or volcanic, volcanic eruption and can be enhanced by a low level jet stream or river, river of air that's uh, coming through the area at higher altitudes. These clouds really start to form at a higher altitude as opposed to right over the fire. And again, what we're getting is uh, moisture introduced into the air from the combustion of a lot of plants called trees or brush or shrubs. Part of the uh, off-gassing besides carbon monoxide would be water vapor. And there's a tremendous amount of water vapor, as you know, in, in plants. So this is moisture coming off burnt vegetation as well as the moisture that might be already contained in the atmosphere. So these clouds are known for their uh, severe turbulence. Any thunderstorm cloud would have uh, severe turbulence if it's tall enough, and these can be to go to great heights. At the surface, they produce strong gust fronts, so they're dangerous for forest fighting operations, tanker operations, and so forth, or transporting firefighters and helicopters. You have to be very careful when flammogenitus occur. I've seen them occur now in forest fires, for instance, in the uh, 1996 Nuttall fire, the Nuttall complex fire in uh, the Pinaleno Mountains. We could see those. If you're not familiar with the Pinaleno Mountains, you may have heard of Mount Graham and its telescope. That's right atop the Pinaleno Mountains. So you'd be looking from Sierra Vista to the northeast. That's north, going to be north of Wilcox. From the area of Whetstone, I could clearly see in the Nuttall complex forest fire flammogenitus clouds occurring. Although we don't understand the total process as to how these things are, are forming, they form, uh, of course, with the uh, hot convective temperatures. So on this forest fire right here, you can see smoke coming off as the gray substance. But what we're really looking at, and they've used the old name here, pyrocumulonimbus. So pyro is fire. We used to call them pyro thunderstorm clouds. So you see a white puff there. That's one just beginning, another white puff. These white puffs have grown, and then a bigger white puff that's growing high up into the atmosphere. And I know it's high because I can see the anvil, the top of the tower being sheared off in the jet stream up there at the top of the troposphere. 
So these clouds are white as opposed to the smoke. Let's look at some examples of these, a few more examples at least. Here's one coming off a volcano. So you see the volcanic ash, this dark material here, and a lot of it will fall out back to the Earth's surface. But I'm looking at the uh, flammogenesis cloud up here that formed. And here's a wildfire that was uh, from 2016 in Canada, Alberta. And you can see a flammogenesis cloud with a pileus top. Very rare that we see these for any length of time, they disappear. It shows there's a lot of convection going on. So the smoke from the fires down here, clearly the white clouds above the smoke are the cumulonimbus cloud that formed. So they can either hinder a fire, and how would they hinder a fire? Well, cumulonimbus clouds have lightning by definition, they're thunderstorm clouds. So they form their own lightning, which can spark other forest fires in the area. So on the other hand, they also form massive amounts of precipitation, you hope. And there's been several instances where these have quelled forest fires on their own. So here's numerous pictures. Starting in the upper right-hand corner, a classic uh, flammogenitus and the cloud top punching farther up here with its cumulus development. Looks very similar to the Hiroshima atomic bomb. This is the after strike photo taken uh, on one of the trailing photographic airplanes of that mission. And they almost look alike. So that's massive convection from the nuclear explosion that formed this flammogenitus cloud up here. Otherwise, the rest of them are from forest fires. And so you can get very distinctive left center here where I'm looking. Uh, smoke definition down here, no, no doubt this gray is smoke, this is smoke, and this is also smoke, but look what's on top of all that smoke, the flammogenitus, the cumulonimbus cloud that's starting. And then down in Yellowstone uh, at the lower right, we see Cumulus towers developing off uh, various fires back in that uh, 1988 season, I think it was in Yellowstone. Now, getting uh, toward the end of the, the clouds, the introduction of the 12 new clouds is Silva genitus. Silva has to do with trees or forests. So if you're a Silva culturalist, you're a person that studies forestry or trees. So this type of cloud is going to be found in forests. And it simply develops from the increased humidity from not only evaporation from the soils in that, in that forest, but also evapotranspiration, which is the transpiring of moisture from the plants themselves. And that moisture evaporates and saturates the atmosphere. So they're only found uh, in the stratus cloud type, a layered cloud type. They form close to the ground. And that's what you're seeing in these photos. And if they're broken up, uh, I show the red arrow featuring the fractus pattern. So we could call it stratus fractus silvogenitus. Those are clouds that are generated by that forest there. And uh, the best chances of seeing these would be in a, in a forest, of course, and then on humid or very moist days right after precipitation has fallen. So you would see these not around here so much as you would see it in tropical environments or up in the Northwest in more humid environments. I'm in Washington and Oregon, some of the forests up there. These are some examples of silvogenitus. Now, my question to you is a, a big one because of the 12 clouds, you need to, to sort them out in your mind. And I'm showing you this one, which is a pretty impressive cloud and asking you, which one of the 12 is it? And it's kind of a self test. I'll give you a moment to think about it. Maybe a hint. It's the most popular cloud of the new 12 clouds. So you should have said asparagus. This was taken in New Zealand. Now I wanted to spend uh, the rest of the time, a couple more slides talking about how you learn about clouds. And right off the bat under my books and cloud title there, I show you uh, birders with binoculars and spotting scopes. And you're often told that birding is a, a fairly cheap sport to get into. Unlike say, for instance, skiing or golf, you might wanna buy some binoculars, perhaps even a spotting scope, but you don't have to, to be a birder. You might just wanna buy some books. Well, with clouds, you don't need a spotting scope or binoculars. 
you might need a simple free cloud chart, which is the one in the upper right hand corner from the National Weather Service. They give these out at public events and it's very easy to come by them. Or you can rely on books about clouds. And if you look in the lower right in those uh, red bordered books, familiar name there, Peterson series, Peterson Field Guides. You already know they produce uh, bird books. Or you can fall back on a free resource and that would be the International Cloud Atlas uh, in the lower right in the red boundary. I show you the first one that's brown, the second one that my friend Ron Hawley was editor of, and then the third one that came out in 2017 listing the new 12 clouds is an online version. So it's free, it's meant to be free. How else can you learn about uh, clouds and weather? Uh, the National Weather Service in all states sponsors a Skywarn program. And, and under that program is their Skywarn weather spotter training program. So what they want are citizen scientists, so to speak. You don't have to be a scientist, but uh, it's people in the field that are not in their weather office, of course. People in the field that can see weather happening because they're not out there. They might be in Tucson and don't understand through their radar what's happening in a shadow zone over in the Sulphur Springs Valley or the San Bernardino Valley. But a rancher that lives there who's a spotter might know. So you go through this course and they're very friendly. There's no prerequisites. I'm showing you some examples from across the US of classroom scenes. They're taught by the actual forecasters from the local National Weather Service office. Some of the uh, offices give out a spotter certificate, but you will be assigned a spotter ID. And the idea is that you would use your ID when you call in or text in to them during some weather event, for instance, a thunderstorm where they give you certain criteria for reporting. So you'll learn the basics of thunderstorm development, hazardous weather, how to inform uh, the weather service and report these features. That's one way to get a free book on weather, the Weather Spotters Field Guide, top center here. And they even now have an advanced class and you can get an advanced spotter, uh, spotter textbook here. What's another way? to learn about weather. Well, you can join or attend the meetings of the Southern Arizona chapter of the American Meteorological Society, CCAMS, the one I'm associated with. So we have a website and it lists our past meetings and speakers. We only meet to hear presentations. In other words, we have no cliques or sub organizations or anything like that. We meet on a monthly basis, except during the summer. So you can hear about weather and we get a rich, uh, spectrum of weather talk. That's part of my job as vice president of the club and Ron's job as president to get speakers. We have the university, we have all kinds of agencies that uh, relate to weather. And so we have a lot of good weather speakers that come. For instance, our next one's gonna be on uh, soaring in Arizona, soaring in terms of glider soaring and how the glider pilots use the thermals off the desert to soar. If you want to know more about it, you can see our website, I put it there or uh, call me if you're interested in either the spotter program or CCAMS. We do have occasionally technical tours. Uh, this last one is a few shots from our viticulture tour where I led one, uh, this technical tour that considered climate meteorology as it has to do with the wine production area. So we went out to the Sulphur Springs Valley look at the soils, we're out there by Wilcox Play and the sand dunes right in that shot. But we drove through many scenic areas and finally into orchards. We visited two orchards and two tasting rooms. And this is a subset of our group that was there that day. A multi-chapter event of people, members in the state of Arizona. So that's where I'd like to leave it. I'm gonna stop sharing right now and turn it over uh, for questions. Our host will introduce the, the questioning sequence to say how that goes. Thank you very much, Glenn. That was absolutely that fascinating. That was so interesting. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, so folks, if you have any questions, if you could go ahead and put them in the Q&A or else you can raise your hand and then we can open up your mic uh, and you can ask the question. Hmm. If you... I have yeah. a question for you, Glenn. I'm sure you're asked it all the time. What I'd like to know is, is there a cloud nine and how can I get on it? <laughs> ah. Like that. I think there's a, a Cloud9 mobile home court that I could get you to locally. That's, that's, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> um, 
you were talking about the books. Presumably, you want to get a book that's been published in the last couple of years if it's going to include these 12 new types. There are some that I showed there that were old, but uh, for the most part, the, the newest types are going to be in the Cloud Atlas. Uh, the other ones there are a little bit older uh, and wouldn't have, they'd have them under a different name. So you'd have to know Pyrocumulus as opposed to Flamagenitus, the new name. So. We have a question from Jan. Jan, go ahead and ask your question. I've seen some contrails that look sort of like cones. Are those a specific type of cloud or? Well, in general, they're contrails, and it's, it's very typical that contrails can evolve to a cone. It's just they're getting dispersed by the, the wind, and from down here, it looks like it's, it's a cone. Um, Not a cone, but a comb like a hair comb. Oh, a comb. Okay. So the, uh, the contrails that I showed you that mutated, um, those are probably what you're talking about, or another interpretation, what you could be talking about, is that the vortices that come off the wingtips, which are where the contrails are really created, uh, interfere with that stream of exhaust or, or streams of exhaust coming off each engine. And they, they make a churning motion, a, a vortical uh, motion. And that's what creates or disperses it. And from down here, it might look like a, if you expand a slinky, and realize that the coil, each coil, the sl slinky, looks like a rib. Uh, I think that's probably what you're looking at. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That's great. We had somebody raise their hand, but then um, they went away. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know who they are. Um, all right. Well, I think your presentation was so thorough. Yeah, very. That People are like. absorbing everything right now. <laughs> <laughs> but does uh, any more questions, folks? You can raise your hand or put them in the Q and A's. Doesn't look like well, we're all good. At the moment. Good. Okay. Well, thank you very much. This is the last of our monthly thank talks. Thank you so much, Glenn. Yeah. And that You're was great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's the last of our monthly talks, and um, we'll be having some more entertainment for you during our virtual spring fling, which will be on May the 4th to the 8th, so watch out for announcements for that. Um, then later in the year, our 30th anniversary summer festival from August uh, 4th to 7th will be taking place. It's a kind of a hybrid. It's going to be a mix of virtual presentations but also some kind of caravan field trips as well, which people will be able to go on. So watch out for more information on that. If you came in late to Glenn's talk, it is, uh, has been recorded. It will be available via our website, which is www.swwings.org. And also on our YouTube channel, which you can reach through a link on the website. So yeah, um, we're very much uh, excited and looking forward to our 30th anniversary later this, is this year. This 30th anniversary this year. Glenn, I know you've been involved for a lot of that, Glenn's which is been there from fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we're newcomers um, uh, oh, compared to you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, thank you everyone for attending. We look forward to seeing you at one of the events later this year. And uh, it's just left now to say- yes. And just look out for our announcements that are going to be coming up, like Chris said. Mm -hmm. And we just want to say goodbye from me. And goodbye from me. Thank you. Take care, everybody.